Uh, welcome everyone to, to this edition of CanCast. I am here today with the very fabulous Paul North, who is the Vanilla Director at Bolt Fast. The Vanilla Director. And, Should uh, just kept that previous one. And if you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if More you the just, swearing. Yeah. And if you've just tuned in, what you've just missed is Paul changing out of one grey jumper yeah. into a slightly lighter grey jumper and deciding that that one was... Highly inappropriate and changing back into this current grey jumper. They okay. used to, at school, I, I used to get called in six form 50 shades of grey, but not for the reasons that you think. <laughs> loads of grey jumpers. And that, is that because you're colour think, blind? You're thinking, oh, that's a. That's yeah, no, it, I think it is partly through my colour blindness. I just feel safe in grey because I know what it is. I know what I'm getting. <laughs> Georgie noticed what, it as well. She's like, what you got a lot of grey stuff. What are you colour blind with? Like red, red, I'm red green colour blind, but it, it varies. Mm like brown i can't really see browns gray is just like my safe place <laughs> <laughs> just stay with gray very gray very gray and blue yeah you Couple do yeah you do rock a you do rock a blue actually i do do it oh thanks mate you're in, you're in <laughs> gray and blue combo today so i think that's cool. yeah, that's our role that's our role um but no thanks for having me mate good to chat no always good to chat so for those that you don't know you or haven't seen you speak before you're from a background of drug treatment which yeah. is a really unique position to be in in this space, I think. Yeah. So could you maybe explain to us how on earth you went from drug treatment to advocating for changes in drug policy? Yeah, defo. It's, it's a bit of a... I, I look back on it and reflect on it, I think it's quite an unusual journey, really. And, and like even maybe six months before I moved over and started working in policy, I would not have imagined ever doing the work and having the experiences that I've had in a, a, like the policy space, which I feel really blessed to, to have had. Well, I feel blessed to have had the treatment experiences and the policy experiences, really. I think I've been quite lucky with it. But I, I, I worked in treatment for nine years and went into it. Just I did a degree in criminology because I thought I wanted to be a police officer. I was like, I'm going to be a copper, uh, like my granddad. I don't know why. And criminology sounded quite cool. And it was really cool. I, I really enjoyed it. But a treatment seemed like quite a natural path for me after that because I'm quite an empathic person. And I, I don't like seeing people being harmed. Mm. It, it really troubles me. I, I, well, I know most people don't, but I have quite strong. I always have really strong reactions to the idea of people being in pain and, and hurting and being unwell. So like treatment was just a really natural flow for me to kind of finish my degree rather than going into the kind of criminal justice -y, you know, catching people and being like in you go into the system i really like the idea of being at the other end or with or within the latter end or not even the latter end but just being in it but saying to people let me help you get out and away from the criminal justice system rather than putting you into it and just letting it do its thing so i kind of um yeah i worked for treatment in, for nine years altogether and worked my way up from doing uh, like frontline harm reduction interventions, needle exchanges, tier two assessments, work, work my way up to being a manager and, and running projects and services. And then I, it sounds really cliche, but I just got so like sick of death. <laughs> I just got like so sick of people dying. It's so depressing, Carly. Like it, it's when I first started in treatment, someone would, I reckon it'd be like every f four, six months, someone would die. And that was like crap enough, you know, like someone that you knew and, had supported passing away mm. but then in the back end and i'm sure it's if not even worse now but it, it would be like every week every couple of weeks there'd be another client that dies and, and that was in york and that even that wasn't even that bad yeah that wasn't even that bad compared to places like leeds hull where it would be like oh, oh there he is <laughs> oh. kicking off kevin <laughs> Kevin, we were, Kevin was so relaxed with me it's, last time. I mean, it's past. Paul. He knows Paul. Pack, Kevin, pack chill yourself, lad. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, in Leeds, it, they would lose like 20, 25 people a month, sort of thing, which is you know, like a person a day. Really, really grim. And I, I guess I, I nine years is a long time to work in treatment. Anyway, it's intense. And I just started like thinking about, well, what else can I do with my knowledge? And for maybe five years of the back end of that career, I started doing training and like lectures and, and training social workers and police officers on drugs and addiction and trying to just broaden their horizon and knowledge a little bit on, on, on that sort of space. And I thought, oh, fuck, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into academia. I'll, um, I'll do a PhD or a master's something. So I started applying to do PhDs 
And then really randomly, while I was like doing that, I was speaking to some really great people that I've known for a while, like Ian Hamilton at, at York University, a mental health lecturer, f- fantastic guy. And um, he just put me in touch with Liz McCulloch, who used to work with Bolt Fast. And she just reached out and was like, I'm writing this report on um, cannabis treatment. And I just, you know, Ian Hamilton said, you'd be a really good person to speak to. And then my eyes just opened up to this like whole space that I didn't even know existed. I had no idea. I was just like, what? There are actually like, maybe I was a bit naive to not really recognize it, but I was like, well, there's actually like groups and organizations that are lobbying and trying to create change that aren't treatment, you know, because I assume treatment would sort of try and do that anyway. But I was like, well, there's this like think tanks and like policy groups. And I, and so I, I helped out with the report. I, I was interviewed for the report that Liz wrote and sort of gave, gave my input. Behind. I had to do, but what was funny is I had to do it behind the scenes. I couldn't even, I couldn't. Couldn't, drug treatment used to be so strict that I couldn't even publicly let the drug treatment provider know right. that I was doing that. There were, we couldn't even have Christmas at one point. They wouldn't let right. us have Christmas. Or they were like, there's no Christmas because it might offend people. It was just, they were so conservative. Do you know what I mean, right. they were so like rigid. So, so I kind of did it in secret. But then, then I just thought, I thought, I've always been quite bolsy anyway, sort of thing. I just thought, do you know what? I'll just come down to London. I'll meet these guys. I'll meet Voltfast. Like, who are these characters? I came down to meet them. I came down for an event that Liz did. And I met Steve. And I thought, he's a character. Isn't it? You know what I mean? I mean, you know Steve as well as I do. Like, and I just thought, what? It was quite an unusual first sort of day, just meeting them all and going around. And then I'm, I remember having this coffee with Steve. And Steve was like, why do you want to work, work in policy? And I just said, well, I'm just sick of people dying, Steve. And like, I think I've got something to give. I think, you know, I think I have a nuanced view of addiction and, and problematic use of not just cannabis, but just drugs in general. And I think I've got something to give. And I, I wanted to do a PhD because I, I need a platform to say these things. And then Steve was just like, you don't need a platform. Just come work for us. And I was mm. like, okay. <laughs> then, like, then I just moved. Yeah. I just moved my life. And before that, had you seen people within treatment using cannabis to get off harder drugs, to get off other drugs? I'd not. So, I'd, I'd seen. I guess with cannabis, I'd seen. I mean, it, it's it's safe to say that like a lot of the treat, a lot of treatment services were and still are geared towards class A's like like heroin yeah. alcohol and and the issue with that is even though there are loads of people that would benefit from visiting for a whole wide range of drugs the service is so slammed by those two groups that you struggle to kind of get out and see over that group and and similarly people don't associate treatment with that yeah so what 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 I what I certainly saw and and my, the way in which I saw I sort of approached this subject is that you know people use drugs problematically because there's something that's going on physically, psychologically, right? And mm-hmm. you, psych, more so psychologically than, than, than physically, for sure. But, but what, I, what I tend to come across is people experiencing, feeling unwell, um, being, being desperately unhappy with the situation, and then using a drug to manage and clear that situation. What I certainly saw is people using other drugs which did the same thing but were less problematic certainly and i saw some use of kind of psychedelics that would fundamentally and radically change someone's perspective so much that they would just stop using the drug altogether yeah dimethyltryptoline ayahuasca being a drug in which i saw people be like i'm going to do this thing i'm going to do this retreat and then come back and be like i ain't touched heroin for months and i don't want to touch it and it'd be like wow that's like that's just rewired the way in which you're you're thinking about things i certainly saw people drop from heroin to 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 alcohol and then drink less alcohol there were some cases of people doing the same thing with cannabis but the the problem and what makes this a bit more it's difficult is what you would often see with the class a's like heroin well particularly heroin to some extent alcohol is the physical withdrawal was such a a, a, a battle that that in itself was such a hard process that it was difficult for them to kind of easily jump onto another drug. Yeah. So like managing heroin withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal is just so messy, like literally messy that it was hard for people to be like, do you know what? I'll just take cannabis. I'll just do whatever else. Cause they still had to go through this kind of, this, this kind of battle. And I think the, the other nuanced part about it is it, it, it you know, you know as well as I do that these drugs create very different experiences and, and heroin is such a good painkiller. Like it's, yeah. it, it's just, I mean, it's, there's the reason why we use it in hospitals, right? There's a reason why we give people diamorphine. It's incredible. So it's it's incredible painkiller. 
for acute, I think it should be used and, and you know, it's really good, opium based painkillers are really good for short term pain. But, yeah, you know, we've known agree. since since we did the studies on mice in the 90s that they that they are crap for long term pain, because actually your body gets so used to it that there's a, you know, that it can cause opioid induced hyperanalgesia, so it can make the pain worse. And, you know, as someone who's come yeah. off fentanyl, which is, you know, the same as heroin, essentially, you know, the, the withdrawal is the same. I can totally see why people back away from that experience. And yeah. it, because the withdrawals are, and I always say it's like train spotting, but more boring because it really yeah. is. <laughs> but, but if I hadn't had cannabis while I was coming off those heroin like drugs, I don't know that I would have got through it, you know, to help yeah. me sleep, the restless, help with the restless legs, to help with the jitteriness, to help with the nausea. I mean, cannabis addressed a lot of those symptoms for me. And I did use a combination of all the herbs as well, but I found it really beneficial. And I know that, you know, in the States they're using it, they're using cannabis oils and uh, particularly mm. one-to-one strains in treatment now to help ease the withdrawal from, from, you know, drugs like heroin. Yeah. Which I think is a really, you know, interesting um, sort of concept really. And a, yeah. you know, a lot of patients, I suppose, typical patients who've been on, you know, lots of pharmaceutical drugs, you know, they would say cannabis has been my exit drug rather than my sort of um, yeah. you know, lead in to, to different drugs. And, and I, I would totally agree with that from personal experience. So it's an yeah, definitely. And, and I think they're like what, I mean, that's why I'm passionate about reform, right? Because I believe in, in, in choice. I believe that people should be able to try these things uh, to, to, to change, change their well-being. Like, I, 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 think, I think there's really interesting evidence and information coming out of North America. But I do think there's a distinction between psychological pain and physical pain. Yeah. And I think this is where I've, people have got, just realized there's boxes in the background, Carly. Look at that. Look at how no, fabulous your background you. is. And I've got moving boxes. Well, you've, everyone's got to move, haven't they, love? So, I mean, I know, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is where I've like people, I think people have got frustrated with me. I, <clears throat> when I first started working for VaultFast, I just got so much stick. It was so draining. Like, just have people like coming at me all the time on Twitter, social media, I'd go to events, people would be like, ah, it's, it's, it's a lot more chill now uh, for a whole range of reasons but like i think i what what my, my view on drugs is from from the psychological perspective is you know dr- drugs can be really effective at helping you deal with emotional pain psychological pain and and distracting you and even on like a recreational angle you know you have a difficult week you have a busy week it's quite nice to let your head down on a weekend whether that be alcohol or whatever else well in some respects you could make quite a nuanced argument that you're escaping from psychological stress you know you are it's fair yeah. enough in, in the same way that you might go for a run or you oh. might kick boxing football whatever yeah. else you we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're forever we you know as humans we're forever burdened by uh um our mind and our thoughts do you know what i mean and, and people have a whole range of ways of dealing dealing with that and everybody's different on that front but what i've always been cautious around is the argument that um cannabis clears and gets rid of those problems i think i think phys- i think physically there's absolutely no doubt about it you know yeah it, it, and and you know you're a fantastic case study and story for that do you know what i mean you're showing people every day in the work that you do the 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 transformation that you've experienced for using cannabis-based medicines and it's undeniably fantastic and you know you know i feel about the input the importance of that but i think the the conversation around the psychological um well-being and stress it becomes a little bit more complicated and without a shadow of a doubt cannabis is safer than heroin like yeah. it's just it's just not even like you would be a fool you'd be a fool to to try and debate that like heroin is as dangerous as cannabis it's, it's clearly not you know it, it's clear it's clearly way more dangerous cannabis is is certainly a safer drug 100 percent. however that doesn't mean that cannabis is a good I, it's not it doesn't mean that it's a good idea to use cannabis to cover up psychological distress and and worry and i think what i the angle i've come at it from with my background in in treatment is that yes cannabis can help with mental distress with depression with anxiety with ptsd all these things of course it can but only in the same way that any drug can and and yes cannabis is safer than alcohol so if you someone came to me and said should i drink alcohol to deal with psychological distress and ptsd or should i smoke cannabis we should obviously smoke cannabis although having said that it's illegal in the uk so the criminalization of it can be worse do you know what i mean like i guess we're talking about a a framework here in which both drugs are legal because 
yeah you know, legally we can't tell anyone to use a drug that's illegal anyway that's committed a crime and also like just getting nicked you know you know you know as well as i do that that can have lifelong effects regardless yeah. you know you could have the most safest relationship with cannabis in the world but get caught have a conviction and then you lose your job and all that sort of stuff so we're talking about a framework in which both drugs are legal cannabis is absolutely safer but i think it's also really important to have a discussion of but it's you're still using it to cover up a problem and i appreciate i've spoken to people who have ptsd and have experienced really horrendous stuff and they say to me look i've tried everything else cannabis is the only thing that helps me function and get through it well that's great that's obviously a good thing and like nice one that again is that is better than you drinking alcohol that is better than a self-harm that you know that that is absolutely better but let's not lose the nuance of it's still covering up a problem and, and i think what i learned in treatment is that what's really useful is for people to give themselves one for people to recognize that so they can do something to help address and manage those underlying psychological problems and you know engage in therapy or whatever else and you know that that and and i again i appreciate the, the situation that some people will find themselves in they'll say look i've tried all that and it hasn't worked but my, my message is always well don't give up don't 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 settle don't settle for just using a drug all the time you know and I, I think there is something to be said around you know having a healthy and positive relationship with cannabis if it is you know if it's helping with a mental health problem because i, I think and again i do have to be quite careful with this and I'm, I'm trying to be nuanced with it but i've certainly met people who are smoking are using ridiculous amounts of cannabis like really 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 high levels of cannabis and i think they it becomes kind of a um it's easy for them to just kind of say oh yeah it helps manage my health problems then it is to kind of just look underneath and go well do you know what maybe if i address some of these things i could have a bit of a healthier relationship with it so i, I so it's know, a tool I, in the box but it you know yeah. i think that you, what you're saying is that it's not it's not solving the root of the problem. And I suppose really research wise, psychedelics have got a better sort of uh, scope for that. And, 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 you know, I think that in terms of what psychedelics do is that they sort of open up those, you know, we all have those very well trodden paths. This happens. So I, you know, I engage with it this way. This happens. So I react in this way. And they're very well trodden sort of, um, pathways in our brain yeah and i suppose what uh what cannabis does is is different to what psychedelics do and that psychedelics open up new pathways so that we can react in a different way and i suppose you know cannabis is the first step i suppose in the uk of us accepting some kind of plant medicine but i think there's much more to come in terms of when we fully embrace and legalize this have we then got the, you know, have, have we then got it in us as a country to, to then further that by looking at psychedelic researchers and, yeah. and what combinations of those things can work for different things? Can people with severe PTSD use cannabis to control their flashbacks while they're also using psychedelics to try and re rewire some of that pathways and, and, and process the trauma? So I guess, you know, it's just, it's a part of, it's a tool in the box, isn't it? A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's got to be framed with, let's get better. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like if, like if the, I have, you know, if, if someone, I, I don't care what people do. I, you know, you know, my views on this sort of thing, I think people should do whatever they want to do. If they feel it makes themselves better, who am I or anybody else to start point fingers and say, you should do this. Totally. I'm, I'm yeah. not in that. That is absolutely not for me. But I think what, what is important is for us as people that advocate for reform and that have an interest in people's mental health and well-being is to make sure that within that we are saying to people well you know just try do try and get better at the same time don't see this as like right you know now taking cannabis then or, or whatever drug then i don't have to think about my mental health anymore like don't don't give up on that ambition of not needing a drug or wanting a drug to manage mental health problems. And that's not to say that some people might go through the whole life using a drug. And I, I always just talk about this in, in treatment. Someone would say, um, do you, do you like AA 12 step models? Do you know what I mean? Like, do, yeah. what do you think of AA and NA? And I'd always say it's like a 12 step model, like the, the abstinence um, model is absolutely no doubt better than being in a really bad place where using drugs all the time and cut like obviously it's better like a hundred percent that is a better situation than people previously but you know it's a bit of a similar thing like 
I don't think that should be the end of the conversation because you know we know from evidence and research that it's a little bit more complicated than I've just got this uncontrollable disease and I think sometimes AA and NA becomes a blocker for people to look yeah. beyond that and going well actually I'm just going to get better I'm not an, I'm just Paul I'm not an addict I'm just me I don't have to have that carry that label around and I think the, the cannabis mental health chat sometimes becomes a similar thing that like I've got this problem that's that I can just never fix so I, I smoke cannabis I think, actually, I think that what you're saying is similar to uh, it sort of reminds me of when when I started using cannabis and obviously I was very unwell and I I had a lot of muscle wastage, so I was just lay around. I was just lay around. I was in agony. You know, I, I was really unfit, really untoned. I was just like a bag of bones. And I think that cannabis kept on top of the pain for me. And it was at that point that I made a decision. Okay, so I'm not in pain. So shall I still lie around? Mm. And, and that's as good as it's going to get? Or shall I use this relief to move? And I think that's what you're saying in a, in a slightly, dif you know, in slightly different context because you're talking about psychological pain is that it, it, when I speak to pain patients and, they, and they're in a really bad way, they might have been in a wheelchair for a few years and, you know, they're getting some relief and that's brilliant. And they're like, okay, so I could sit here and I could, um, you know, I could be pain-free. I could sit here yeah. pain-free. Or you could use that relief and use that momentum to get up and to move, to exercise, to regain your muscle strength, to be more well. Um, yeah. and I, I don't, I think that's a mentality thing and I don't, you know, I don't think that's an easy attitude always to come to, particularly in, in, in the case of mental health. Um, but I do think opening up these conversations to people who are using cannabis for lots of different, um, conditions is a good thing because, you know, we can only help, we can help each other, can't we, by, by using these conversations to, to talk about what's helped for each individual. Hundred percent, yeah, definitely. And actually, on the on on the on the point of mental health, you brought up a point which is something that I was going to ask you: is that since you moved from the drug treatment sector to the cannabis space, you said, "Oh, you know, you get a lot of stick online." And I can't tell you how much stick. <laughs> <I> have. <laughs> oh, <laughs> honestly, and and you know, some days I can have a really good laugh about it. So last night, yeah. for example, I had a message saying um that i was part of the new world order oh i get them i get illuminati ones oh and i was like oh my god now They're i'm illuminati my yeah and and you know last night i could laugh about it but some days it does it does really hit me and then it's hard you know you wake up it's on your phone it's facebook you know yeah. you're being attacked or you know people are accusing you of stuff or threatening to slit your throat or something yeah. like that just, and then you have to get up and you have to sort of move positively on with your day and try and speak to the police about a new idea or speak to some patients who are struggling and, and it and i wondered how you coped yeah with the transition into a space that was quite chaotic yeah it's it's, it's chaotic in a number of ways i think it's a really interesting conversation because because treatment is i mean treatments you, you don't really get that and, and i think that the, the challenge i had was there's and, and something that one day i just look i look forward to just not having this not being a thing but you will experience this as well that like our jobs what we do uh, you know because there's a lot of similarities in, in the work that we do right it, it, a lot of it is very public so you, you almost like as soon as you got the job or, or you know as soon as yourself you start advocating you have to have a public profile because if i just disappeared off all the social media now which a Georgia would love you know like if I would just like just sacked it off and never looked at it then I couldn't really do the job that I'm doing I, I couldn't it would be so difficult for me to carry out the work that I do at Vaultfast I would have to do it all through proxy through other staff through yeah. the Vaultfast account and stuff and it just doesn't it just doesn't have the same thing and, and like even for you to just be plugged in and aware of what's going on you have to have a social media account so I, I found that like exciting but also anxiety inducing because you kind of like I remember the first Thing, actually i remember working with alistair and george and henry and thinking right how many followers have they got right i have to go up to that you know it was instant like well how right. how many likes and retweets do they get for their stuff and so, so so i think i feel this on two levels one is with the drug reform crowd and advocacy crowd it's very cliquey it's, it's i find it a bit sad it's very yeah. very cliquey very them and us there's lots of boring politics that people get involved in that i just stay well clear of like not interested but it's very very cliquey even amongst the people i idolized prior to working in treatment you know, i was aware of many big names i don't want to start dropping names and, and causing trouble on this but like you know I, I looked up to a lot of these people but then when you're in the space 
it becomes very, there's a lot of egos. There are a lot of egos walking around this space and, and it, it deeply frustrates me and upsets me that egos come before harm. You know, I did a podcast about this the other day with, 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 uh, uh, Julia Zampini, who's a, a lecturer at Greenwich Uni, you know, our focus should be how do we stop people dying and how do we make people better? That should be our, that sh- absolutely should be our number one priority. Not, my ego and my work like that should be five six seven eight ten on the list yeah number one should be let's stop people dying let's reduce the harm that our, our drug policies currently do and let's be open and collaborative and positive with everybody that's interested even the people that disagree with us right even daily mail readers let's be positive and kind and collaborative because until we do that more people are going to die but people's egos get in the way and oh, anyway i could rant for hours about that so, so that that's one issue I found. And the other one is, and, and it, it's a little bit of an elephant in the room, and this is throwing a grenade in there a little bit, but there is an unhealthy correlation between deep-rooted conspiracy theories and cannabis. Like, the, the, there is, like, there are a lot of the communities that I started to see, become involved in, like, there is certainly a correlation there between being really, really, really into cannabis, really passionate about cannabis, and this like inst- almost like instinctual um habit of connecting anything that you disagree with or you struggle with with um some kind of conspiracy that's we we get we got stuff all the time saying that like vault fast was involved like the illuminati and we were connected to george osborne and we were profiteering from gw fam just like wild and wonderful things like like seriously yeah. seriously wild and you know that that is a conversation i think that we don't have it enough with the community like what is that what is that about because i you don't see this with alcohol you don't see this with cocaine you don't see this with ketamine you don't see this with psychedelics so much like that you know and you can go and visit people that are passionate about those drugs and that have those communities and those sort of demographics and there just isn't that correlation there so like i appreciate it's a little bit of a bit of a controversial conversation but but like i i very quickly started embarking on that when i worked at vault fast a couple of tweets saying that i was going to talk about cannabis and mental health and already i had people sort of um attacking me and the thing that was weird about it was always be from anonymous accounts you know we go out there as paul yeah. north you go out as carly barton we tweet as ourselves we do videos like this is ourselves we write blogs we write articles as ourselves and what you would then find is this sort of like anonymous all these anonymous accounts that don't have the real name and, and that in itself is interesting because i think psychologically it allows someone to be very cruel yeah. Because they, dis- they they almost associate the account. It's not them. It's not their name. So they can say these things and tweet these things and send you these pictures and all sorts, all sorts. I had people say my uh, my sister dies and stuff a lot, like we like we from these anonymous accounts. And you just think like, wow. It's just, it's, yeah, it, 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 it's I just find it a bit a bit un, a bit un, unusual really. But I, I think it's I, I think it's a conversation. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting conversation, and and I think the, I think I think it's got better, as in right. as in as in 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 the past four years, there is there is less of it, but, and and I think maybe, it, it was difficult when I when I, I first came into the space, but now like I it's just like water off a duck's back now, but I, I think partly that's due to just like, it, you know, four years of of people being. You know, trolling you or whatever or, or being weird online you, you, you do you do build some natural resilience to it um mm. but yeah it's, it, it's it's i don't know what your thoughts are on it but it is quite i, I do find I mean, it, dif- it differs it differs day to day for, for the way that i you know the way that i sort of personally handle it and i guess that's got to do with my own emotional state and whether <laughs> i'm you know whether i'm tired or or whatever it's you know some some days it's difficult and some days it's it's easier to say okay so that person i don't know that person's situation i don't yeah. know how much pain they're in i don't know yeah, what's that, going that, on at home i don't know you know who's yeah. you know i don't know what their mental health's like i don't know how yeah. you know I, do, I don't know who's told them what about me so i suppose some days I can zoom out and go, okay, so I, I don't know that that person's, um, you know, that, that person might feel like they're attacking me or my work for good reason. You know, yeah, that, that's, but, that's maybe yeah. the intent, but, uh, and some days, it, you know, some days it's different. So yeah, yeah I, think I mean, it, it's a hard, it's hard sorry, space mate. to be in. And I think there are a lot of different opinions as well. There are a lot of cliques within the cannabis community 
And I think that all of those, all of those different groups have very different way of imagining what they would like to see. I, you know, and they're very firm. I'd like it to, to be done this way, I'd like it to be done this way, I'd like it to be done this way. And, and they're quite sort of each, each sort of uh, trajectory contradicts the other. And so there's a lot of infighting. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, when I spoke to the advocates in Canada and the States, they were like, oh, it's the same. Oh, really? It's okay, the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were like, oh, yeah, you know, we've got some people who, who were like, okay, we need to immediately grow your own, immediately have it in shops, immediately, you know. And then we've got those people who think it's going to come in stages and, you know, mm. and they're sort of internally bickering. And so I think it's, you know, I think because it's such a wide area and it also sort of picks on lots of different areas of society. So, so I suppose drug policy in particular, particular to cannabis, it sort of dips into sort of legal realms, social services, it dips into the health yeah, sort of absolutely. arena. And, and, and so there's lots of different things to consider. And in that, you've got lots of different types of people using it for lots of different reasons. And so everybody's yeah. got their opinions, haven't they? Yeah, and, a, and an agenda. And this is one thing that I've ran about mm. the other day that like, uh, what, what, another, and again, I, I'm sorry if this ends up becoming too controversial. I'm sure you, you can cut it out. Whatever, but, but like, it, what, annoys, what annoys, annoys me is our goal should be reducing the harm, right? Our, our goal should be loads of people are dying due to our drug laws. They're really harmful. But our goal should be reducing that through achievable means and and I, you mentioned like the conflicting messages that exist in the in the context of people sort of being rude and like aggressive on online right i, I don't think there's any excuse for people to be rude and aggressive online but i get that they they just want in a particular world view whether it be homegrown or whatever else blah, blah blah you know they want a particular model but i think what frustrates me is we shouldn't pursue those w models at the expense of anything happening we mm. should work with what we've got work with the governments and systems that we've got drug reform is not an excuse to overthrow capitalism and some people use it as that some people are using drug reform as a way it's a, it's a bit like cr a critique of extinction rebellion you know people have said ap climate change is absolutely bad like we definitely need to do something about climate change but that doesn't mean we have to like change every single thing around our system do you know what i mean like it, it and i think drug reform sometimes gets a little bit captured in that route and that's not to say that there aren't valid arguments for those models of course there are because those models are based upon people seeing and experiencing harm you know they're typically left-wing models people seeing harm and not wanting oppression so they're, they're they're valid ideological positions but i think what what's really interesting in the policy space is we all come with our own ideology and agenda naturally through just the way in which we operate as human beings. We all have our own, well, I would like the world to be this way, or I would like the world to be that way. But in the policy space, I think there has to be a personal responsibility to advocate for what can actually happen because people are dying while we mess around arguing with people that are never going to agree with us. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's like the people that are saying we should legalize all drugs. Well, not right now because that's never going to happen the only way you're going to see the legalization of all drugs is through a drastic overthrow of the way in which we operate as a society and the way in which the government understands these issues mm -hmm. that's the long i'm not saying that that's not a sensible position based on yeah. evidence I'm not, I'm not i'm not going to but I'm it's just not saying, a speck of a switch thing is it because it's attitudes it's people we can't you it's know two percent public support for cocaine legalization is somewhere like two percent mm. i mean you, you, you know you we we have to pursue the models and the initiatives that are, that are achievable. And, and I think sometimes in the cannabis space, people that are very passionate and, and rightly so, you know, it's, 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 their, it's their passion. Who, who, who are we to say that it shouldn't be people that are passionate about cannabis have a particular way in which they want that to look like that is very much based around their experience of the drug and use of the drug. And that's fine. That's a really relevant, important voice and it should absolutely be at the table. But when it comes to like, what's achievable and what's practical let's recognize that regular the the Drug misuse of drugs act is an, is uh, you know it's a hell of an act that we need to do we need to change but like it's that's going to be a it's a it is definitely a process yeah. as we've seen in canada and even For that sure. first attempt it might not even be that great you know yeah. you go speak to cannabis users in canada and they're like you know i can't really get all the strains i want we bought on the illicit market is still a little bit better the, the canadian government haven't expunged everybody. you know th there's, there's still lots of things but it's a process, do you know what I mean? Sorry. I'm and actually, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best things that I thought Vault Class did was that little documentary where 
you took the MPs to Canada <laughs> yeah, so to go <laughs> drag the MPs around Canada <laughs> to, to have a look at what cannabis looks like over there. And actually, the funny story because I was actually over there. I was, I was, I've obviously been unwell for a long period of time, and it was like the first trip where I was going abroad on my own and I'd been asked to speak at this event and I was going to speak to a load of industry people about why they should let patients, why they shouldn't be sort yeah. of arguing against home grow. So I was sort of going there to back yeah. the patients and they flew me out to go and basically give them an earful about why they should let, you know, they shouldn't be putting money into stopping patients from growing their own because it's really important. And anyway, so I thought I was in Canada on my own. So I was like, Bloody hell, look at me in Canada. Never thought I'd see <laughs> the day on my own. One stick. And then, I, and then I was sat in the lobby of the hotel farting about on my phone. And I heard this thick northern accent <laughs> from Miami going, Carly. And I turned around, it was bloody Paul North, wasn't it, in the hotel. That's I was so like, random. I'm not on my own, am I? <laughs> so random. It was the most random thing I've it ever It was unbelievably seen. random. We did. We had no idea that was a cannabis conversation at the hotel. I had no idea that you guys had dragged a load of secretly dragged a load of MPs <laughs> to bloody you. Toronto because uh, really it was all hush hush, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I did. I do yeah. think that that was, you know, those kind of things where we, you know, that's the that's the beginning of this process, isn't it? It's not an easy process to change hearts and minds. It's really not. No, it's and really actually. Hard. We have to get to the people who can stand up and make those cha those changes in that position of power. And so, what you guys did, I thought, was really clever. In oh, cheers, mate. Took those MPs to to a place where they could see what you know, yeah, what a mo what a model looks like, what our model looks like. Because let's face it, there's you know, there's thousands of possibilities here. Mm. Um, and I think that one thing that I'm and actually this this could be this could be my last question because I'm going to ask everybody this. And this sort of leads nicely into it. So if I gave you like a magic wand now, and you could wave it on behalf of a cannabis... Oh, I was going to say, I'd pack all my, root, my boxes up for my house. Yeah, mate. yeah. well, I'm afraid that's, you know, <laughs> that, isn't, that isn't part of the wand. Thing. <laughs> yeah, You're going to have to get off your ass and do that yourself. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so if you could wave a magic wand and like sort out cannabis in the UK in some way, if it was like the perfect situation or scenario yeah. what would it look like the perfect model sort of thing yeah like like that wouldn't it need further regulation and years and years and years if, of it yeah if you could just waft waft a sparkly pink let's say pink yeah. wand <laughs> over this over Pink's the fine. whole situation oh, and just and just have anything what would it look yeah. like I, I think i would have a model that isn't necessarily the model i want because i think my approach is we need we need to recognize that not everybody in society whether we like it or not has uh, my ideological worldview and position and it would be um slightly narcissistic for for my answer to that to think like what's good for like me and me only because i think that wouldn't work my, my my thinking about this like i would want something that works and what i mean by works is is um enjoyable it's a lot of fun it, it allows us to appreciate and enjoy the drug and celebrate the drug it also gives clear messages to young people and vulnerable people about the harms of the drug and has an honest conversation with them um is sensibly regulated so that a, a wide range of people can access it without problem um so like i, I would want something that uh, you know young in which young people are protected yeah um so young people aren't allowed to procure the product much like we have with alcohol i would be willing to sacrifice some of that public health and harm for a wider enjoyment so like i think I, I i come at this from the angle of like you can implement one model that's like really heavy on public health and like really really heavily regulated it plain packaging all, all that sort of thing but then i think that's kind of the safest model but does el eliminate the black market I think you still see illicit markets when the experience isn't fun enough. So I would want a model that the majority of society could engage with and enjoy and would get access to a wide range of products. So essentially what I think would be the most popular effective model for people out there who would, who would use it positively use it so that cannabis users would say, I am going to go to the shop rather than calling my dealer because that's a better, that, that's a better product. So I, I would want a, a, a regulatory model similar to alcohol, in which yeah. you could buy and procure cannabis quite easily. It would be sold in a wide range of shops. It wouldn't purely be D 
dispensaries and nothing but dispensaries that are few and far between. You could get it in the same way in which you could get alcohol. I would want and permit branding that I think the majority of people would be comfortable with and enjoy once the stigma of cannabis is reduced because I appreciate you're asking me for like the end model rather than what you would yeah. uh, work towards. But I think cannabis should be marketed. I think you should have branding on it. I know people get stressed out and worried about by the alcohol industry and there's lots of uh, fear mongering around, you know, alcohol, but it, you know, step outside your ideological bubble, go down to a pub or go to a American men's club and ask the people in there, do you like alcohol and do you like the way it's marketed? And do you like the, you know, most people will say yes to that. It's only the kind of public healthers, um, or, or people that are left leaning that have those major fears around alcohol. The majority of people quite enjoy and, and, and like alcohol and don't mind it being advertised and marketed in the way in which it is. So I would permit the same thing for um, cannabis. I would make sure like pricing wise, it needs to be cheaper than what you would get on the street. Certainly initially, I don't, I don't think it should be, I don't think the industry should be solely focused on how much money and maximizing profit. I think, I think it should be affordable, but not so cheap that it's kind of, ridiculously priced you know what i mean some something in the sensible region um homegrown i think you should have homegrown models i think you should have cannabis social clubs i think people should certainly be able to grow their own cannabis and their own plants and i don't think that's something that we should land crazy crazy heavy regulation on i think it is over egged the kind of child protection child safety element because like you know <laughs> yeah I, I i think i think that that can be over egged somewhat so so definitely homegrown uh, definitely cannabis social clubs but certainly a, a regulated market in which adults can access what should be an enjoyable experience with a really really wide range of products that's a really waffly answer no it's excellent i was thoroughly enjoying it <laughs> i just want so, it to be fun so it's like coming to a bp near you yeah it was be BP, well i mean you sell BP booze in there 24 hour garage yeah it's brilliant i think so i mean you can you can buy booze why shouldn't you be able to buy why shouldn't you be able to buy cannabis i don't think we're i don't think we're ready for that and like version no. one version one of the model yeah it's absolutely yeah, not going to be that it's going to be it's going to be something similar to canada the first the first legalized model you see in the uk will be similar to canada do you know what i mean yeah. like, let's not let's not let's not kid ourselves but if, if for the end goal I, I think the diversity of cannabis should be at the forefront of the market it shouldn't just be about smoking really strong strong joints it should be about all the stuff do you know what i mean all the cool innovations of 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 method of ingestion all the cool sort of range of experiences that you can have from cannabis from very very light moderate help you concentrate help you sleep all the way through to borderline hallucinogenic all those experiences should be on offer and what i would like to see a market do is educate people on them because people mm -hmm. say to me all the time people mainly want just really strong weeds mainly want to smoke skunk blah 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 which if you look in north american canada is true there's definitely a preference towards that but at least allow the market to educate people through diversification of choice do you know what I mean? Post, you know, Prohibition America, when, when people got used to drinking moonshine. Mm. So like, you know, if you suddenly drop a regulated market in, there's going to be a natural preference towards what people are, are, are drinking. But, it, you know, look at it now. It's a diverse market with a diverse range of experiences. So I think, kind of, I think cannabis should be the same. Love it. Well, thanks so much for having a NASA with me, Paul. Been Sorry, lovely mate, to, been I hope lovely I didn't go off you. track or get us in no, trouble too haven't. much. It's lovely to see you on your moving boxes. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having us on, mate. Anytime.